So I'm here to talk about the history of LARP, and my purpose in doing so is uh, twofold. Uh, first of all, to educate you and all of us a little bit on the history of live role playing, but secondly, to give you a bit of uh, a crash course in, uh, in what live role playing is and can be, and the many different forms it can take. So, first a disclaimer I am not a historian. Uh, I'm actually not even a proper academic. I have a degree in interaction design, which is this fluffy, arty stuff. Um, but I'm often quoted as if I were an academic on, on the LARP design issues. Uh, what I'm about to teach you is stuff that I've scrounged together from a number of sources and which true historians might protest against. However, no, no real historian has tried to write a history of role playing. 99.99% of LARPers are not real historians uh, and not trained in being critical of their sources and so on. Uh, and often, when you ask them about their history and where their group comes from and who was first and did they do big games in the old days and so on, as Johanna, who will be talking to you later, discovered, they often kind of exaggerate, lie, and twist. The, I mean, memory is tricky, you know. Uh, so I've been trying to look at more reputable sources, and that means that some things are missed because I can't read the language uh, or because I couldn't find the source. What is LARP anyway? Well, it's actually an acronym. Uh, we've started spelling it lowercase, but uh, it's originally an acronym for live action role playing. Uh, nobody is really happy with this word. It sounds like lard. Um, and many alternatives have been proposed, uh, including interactive literature, uh, interactive drama, my own invention in drama, not very proud of that one, um, and, uh, and so on. But LARP is the name that has been sticking, so that's what we call it. And the most important words here are role and play. The live action I'll come back to later where this, these two words come from. Now, for the two of us to LARP, we need some simple things. First of all, I need to pretend to be somebody else. Hello, my name is not Eric. Who's Eric? My name is Napoleon Bonaparte. But if I walk around talking uh, as if I were Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, the, um, the French, um, early French dictator slash president, um, then that usually isn't enough to get me classified as a role player. That's enough to get me uh, locked into an asylum. Um, so, to role play, I need somebody else to interact with me. Uh, so, if I pretend to be Napoleon Bonaparte, and you pretend to be Napoleon's trustworthy advisors and court and opponents and so on, then suddenly it's a lot easier for me to pretend to be Napoleon Bonaparte. And I've chosen this picture, it's one of my favorite law pictures. Uh, it shows just such a, such a situation with two people role playing. That the guy to the right, he has grown up in a trash yard, uh, the pro the protected by a trash dealer. Um, he uh, comes from a deeply traumatic background. Um, this is all stuff he's pretending to be. Uh, he is barely able to talk to other people. Uh, and for the first day of this LARP, he just goes around hiding from people and so on until he meets this girl who he sees in the distance and decides that she must be an angel. And so this very inept, very damaged, very troubled kid tries to court her. And eventually, he manages to get her to uh, attend a date with him. And this, this is the date. where It's in the trash yard, uh, in the middle of a ton of garbage. And he's made like a nice seats from, from old toilets and, and so on. You know, all of this stuff that he actually did, he went and found the toilets and dragged them up and put them up and so on. And here they're sitting, interacting. And he's still being like, oh, I'm... Peter, I'm not, I can't, 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 can't say. And she is reacting to that, smiling, confirming his role, telling him he is not insane. And he, on the other hand, is telling her uh, all the time, indirectly, through everything he's saying to her, that she is the character she pretends to be. Now, these people know each other in real life. You know, um, we often say about role playing that it's like theater without an audience. Um, and that's a half truth. Because if you look at the bigger picture, uh, the, uh, the folks uh, were somewhere in the middle here, and that's where this date took place. We are in a square in the center of Oslo, the year is 2000. The LARP is called America with a K, uh, and like a circle around the A. Um, and obviously, this picture was taken from a balcony above. There was lots of audience. There were uh, probably thousands of people who walked past during this weekend and saw this trash yard and all these weird people hanging out in the trash yard playing some kind of magical realist game. Uh, and some of them just stood there glued, glued to the image, observing whatever was going on, even though it was very slow. So role playing can have an audience. But if we go back, they don't care about it. That's not what's going on here. Uh, they are pretending to be people having a date. 
Um, and uh, the audience is just a minor annoyance and so on. They're not doing anything to show off to the audience. They're not communicating with the audience the way I'm communicating with, with you, you now. Uh, it's purely in their minds and for their sake they're doing this. So there are actually two branches of definitions of role-playing in LARP. Um, I just gave you my favorite version where you're talking about two people pretending to be each other, uh, to be other people uh, in a fictional world. But we also have uh, the Turku school definition, which is that uh, LARP or role playing is immersion to an outside consciousness. Uh, so in this definition, you only need to you need to pretend to be a character. You need to pretend to be someone else, and then you're role playing. Uh, the other people are kind of incidental. Uh, and this is my favorite definition: meeting between players who, through their characters, relate to each other in a fictional world. Uh, and the fictional world is kind of important in role-playing, uh, because when I'm saying, I'm Napoleon Bonaparte, and you're saying, yes, President Bonaparte, Emperor Bonaparte, what do you want us to do? Then we are building this world, this illusion that we are now in uh, 19th century France, uh, where there is an Emperor Napoleon, um, and so on. And for every interaction we have, we keep deepening that illusion of being in 19th century for France and not at Ruta in 2014. Now, if we look at LARP at the moment, I show this slide every year, and every year somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, <coughs> you forgot a spot, you know, and I appreciate that. Please do that if you know of something I missed. But this, knows, this shows um, the countries where I have good reason to believe that LARP is being practiced on a regular basis. They are pink. And since last time I showed this, there have been some more happy pinks around there. We now know that the Japanese do have some LARPs. We know that there is LARP in Lithuania. We didn't know that before. Uh, <laughs> and since the first time I made this map, there has been, there has been LARP in Palestine, uh, and Bulgaria had forgotten, and it's now confirmed that the LARP scene in Turkey is alive and kicking. It was believed to be dead. Uh, so I'm quite sure that some of the grey spots and some of the white spots on this map um, are sort of still have like, uh, active LARP communities on, and LARP production. So LARP is big, I mean, in the sense that when you have something that's practiced in all these countries, it's, it's not as big as television, and it's not as big as, as theatre, uh, but it still is uh, going on all over the world, and probably right now there are multiple people all over the world uh, playing live role-playing games. So where does this come from? How did it begin? Martin Eriksson. <laughs> looks through uh, ancient Egyptian ritual. This is uh, an inscription by some scribe who was an assistant to the pharaoh uh, and describes this great ritual he held uh, where uh, I brought forth the coming, I brought forth the god Osiris and blah, 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 blah. Uh, I have the quote somewhere. Uh, and there you can interpret this as being a description of a LARP. Uh, it is possible, although Martin also admits that uh, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, Mika Poyola looks into ancient Greek theatre and finds in the Greek proto-theatre, like the stuff they did before they did all this uh, Aristotelian stuff that they are famous for today, uh, in the primitive Dionysian rites, uh, he finds strong parallels with today's live role-playing. Lizzie Stark, in her, uh, her uh, book about American LARPers, points to the court of Queen Elizabeth and claims with some justification that Queen Elizabeth was a LARPer because she really loved this pageantry. And if you wanted to welcome uh, Queen Elizabeth, it might be nice to have like a bunch of knights riding out and have a dragon for her to slay and stuff like that. Um, although we Scandinavians know that we have some Swedish kings who were very much into the same kind of stuff uh, and might have been so before the English copied us. Um, and so on. And the, I mean, these examples, and there are actually a lot of them, the more we dig, the more somebody finds some kind of Roman, ancient Roman ritual or uh, some practice in a village in Botswana that goes on today, and so on, that strongly resembles what we call live role-playing. Now, I'm still not going to talk much more about that, because if Queen Elizabeth was a LARPer, she never wrote anything about it. Uh, and people did not follow her tradition. Uh, at some point after the 18th century, this court pageantry tradition dies out. Um, so if these were early LARPs, those traditions were interrupted. And also since we can't really say for sure whether what they did was actually role-playing, um, then we can't really claim that that's our history. Although we can claim that's our kind of prehistory, that people have been doing this role-taking all through human history. 
And of course, once we look into the rich and complex history of the theatre and various performative arts, then there is a whole lot of stuff to draw from, but they still don't call it role-playing. And they still don't seem to approach it exactly the same way as we do. So what I've done is I've looked at the word itself, role-playing. Uh, because once we see the word role-playing pop up in some country, in some context, then we know, okay, they have heard this word from someone. It comes from somewhere. There is an influence. And in this way, we can uh, find a history of LARP. And I can now reveal to you the exact time and place where role-playing as we know it, or our tradition as we know it, came into being. <laughs> and it was here. Uh, in the city of Vienna, in the park of Augalten, part of the Imperial Gardens of uh, Vienna. And the year was 1908. This is before the First World War. Uh, Vienna is the capital of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire or Habsburg Empire. Uh, Europe has not yet torn itself to pieces in the, in the First World War. Uh, it is a very conservative, very bourgeois society, um, strictly controlled, but at the same time the wealth and prestige of Vienna attracts a great number of free t thinkers. Now the Augarten Park was frequented by children uh, from the neighborhood around who came there to play. And in this year, in 1908, the children started telling strange stories about what they experienced in the park. There was a young man, black clad, speaking with a strong foreign accent who would hang around the park and watch them play. This young man, after a while, was not content merely to watch the children to play. He stepped in and asked to tell them stories. The children listened. They liked stories. They liked storytelling. He apparently seemed to impersonate uh, the rat catcher of Hamelin, uh, leading children around, them following him, him telling stories as they followed. He climbed up into trees and sat on high branches, uh, having the children sit at the bottom of the tree and listening to him telling stories. And the children liked the stories, and they liked the strange foreign man. So they kept on coming, and after a while of him observing them play and telling stories to them, he starts offering suggestions. What if you uh, make up this rule for your play? What if you try to, to be the father for a long time? What if your father has a, uh, when you're pretending to be a father, that you have a name? Stuff like that. Uh, this is not very precisely recorded. Um, and the children go along with the suggestions, and he watches them uh, play in a more structured manner. He proposes to them that they form their own little theatre group, and they do so. They play, they interact with each other, stories emerge, they enjoy this very much. They ask, but what about the adults? I mean, remember, this is Vienna, of, uh, 1908, it's a very hierarchical society. Children are supposed to behave. What about the adults, the parents, the teachers, and so on? And the young black colored man tells them, don't care about that stuff. You know, just have fun. Uh, eventually, the children begin refusing to come along to activities their parents have planned for them. Cinema is also in its earlier days. The children are invited to, in the neighborhood are invited to go to the cinema, and they refuse to go because they would much rather go to the park to, to play with the mysterious black-clad foreigner. This caused some concern, and when the young man was told through friends and acquaintances uh, that people were looking for him, suspecting him of being a pederast, he decided to stay away from the park. That man grew up to be this man, Jakob Levi Morino. Uh, he, was, he came to Vienna from Romania. Uh, he was a Sephardic Jew, um, and uh, as a citizen of the empire, he could travel freely to study medicine in Vienna. Uh, so it was at this point of time he met the children in Augarten as a young medicine student. Um, and he is known today mostly as the inventor of psychodrama, uh, which I'll come back to shortly but also as a pioneer in the fields of psychology and of sociology. Like when sociologists talk about role, and we talk about role, we're using the same words, it's not a coincidence. This guy is at the beginning of both traditions. He's also, he was also the inventor of group therapy and a number of like early in innovations in social sciences. So Moreno essentially uh, asked the question, what happens when we structure play? And he continued pursuing the question, what happens when we structure play throughout his life? And after his experience with the children, he started pursuing another question. What happens when we invite adults to play? Can we bring this spontaneity, this creativity, this joy of co-creation and these stories that emerge uh, to adults? And can that do anything useful? Moreno's first invention uh, his first attempt to bring this uh, spontaneity and creativity that he had seen with the children to adults was something called the theatre of spontaneity. 
Uh, in, I think, 1918 or 1919, Morino traveled to Moscow uh, in the early years after the uh, revolution and became acquainted with this thing called the living newspaper that were basically theater troops uh, performing today's news. Um, today we would maybe recognize it as a kind of newscast. What Moreno did was slightly different though. In his theater of spontaneity, he would grab people from the audience and ask them to come up and help enact the news. So he would const constantly blur the boundaries between what was going on on stage and what was going on in the audience. He also experimented with other forms in the theater of spontaneity. Now, Moreno is not really a central person in the history of theater. He was not from a theater background. He did not really stay with the theater later in life. Uh, but he was, in this phase, somewhat of a rebel, rebel against the standard theatre, uh, challenging it uh, to bring in more spontaneity and creativity. He felt that the writing of a theatre play was far more creative and a far more worthwhile spiritual task than the playing of a play. Marino's second invention uh, was uh, called psychodrama, and psychodrama is still a thing. Uh, you can go to uh, many cities in the world and find a psychodrama ther therapist. Now, psychodrama is uh, role-playing used for therapy, used for healing, although not necessarily used for the healing of mental illnesses. It can be as much about dealing with life uh, for anyone and everyone. There was for a while a theatre of, of psychodrama in New York where you could go in every evening, buy a ticket and join a psychodrama session. Uh, and people did do that. Uh, in psychodrama, uh, you have one person, the protagonist. I'm simplifying a bit here, but uh, very often you have a protagonist. Somebody comes to the session and says, I want to help you deal with this memory, this issue, this problem. The psychodrama instructor constructs a scene around it, uh, recruits other people from the group to help be the other people in this scene. So I'm really struggling with that point when I failed my university exams and felt that it disappointed my whole family and I'm still angry about that and I'm having trouble dealing with it. I might say, okay, uh, so when did you really feel this? Well, when I called my father and told him that I had flunked. Uh, okay, so let's, let's pretend that, the instructor might ask. You stand here, uh, was that the way you stood? Uh, now I was sitting. Okay, here's a chair. Sit. Uh, do you remember, was this the posture you took? Yeah, kind of. Okay, so you over there. Uh, now you will be the father. And, and let's recreate this episode. And then we do so. Uh, and the instructor asks, how did you guys feel about this? And then we talk a little bit about that. And he says, okay, how do you think you should have talked? What should have happened? And then you might go back and you might replay it in a different way. And that's short version, this is kind of the way psychodrama functions. A psychodrama session also has a warm-up, a beginning where people learn to trust each other. It has a form of debrief or landing session where people talk through things. And part of the point of psychodrama is not just the experience of that guy in the middle, the protagonist, but the way that everybody around the protagonist can relate to the situations faced by the protagonist. It's amazing how many, sim how many similar issues we human beings face. Now, Moreno's third uh, innovation uh, in the field of role-playing uh, was sociodrama, essentially taking what he was doing in psychodrama and scaling it up to a larger group of people. So you could go into a workplace and you could have them sit down in a circle and pretend to have a meeting and the boss is sitting there being very bossy, and then the instructor comes in and says, OK, pause, let's see what's, what, what happens when you, Alice, can you be the boss? And then Alice sits down and she begins performing the role of the boss and she does it in a similar way to the way her boss usually does it. And her boss is now standing on the sidelines watching Alice pretending to be him or filling the same role as him rather. Uh, and suddenly seeing, oh, oh, this isn't working at all. Now I see why people are frustrated with our meeting culture and this creates a dialogue. Marino's term for all of these three form forms, uh, psychodrama, the theater of spontaneity, uh, and social drama, was role-playing. That's where it comes from, kind of the umbrella term. And of these three forms, there you can still find so some social drama groups around. The theater of spontaneity died quite quickly. There are other th improvisational theater um, uh, groups and traditions that have different origins later. Um, but the theatre of spontaneity from Moreno didn't really go anywhere. But psychodrama is still being practiced all over the world. Psychodrama is not big though. It's not very fashionable. It's a bit outside of the, uh, of the professional psychological context and it's a bit outside of academia. Uh, some of the psychodrama instructors you meet are kind of a bit hippie-ish, sorry to say. 
Uh, but uh, but Sakurama is, even though this is still around, Marina's influence to our day does not actually come straight through psychodrama. It comes through a much, much more complicated path. I love complicated paths. Herman Kahn, one of my favorite bad guys of the 20th century. Uh, he was an early futurist, uh, a researcher of the future. Um, in deeply involved with the American military industrial complex during the Cold War. He worked at this institution called the Rand Corporation. Um, it's still around. And the Rand Corporation was set up in the 50s, I believe, um, as part of the whole Cold War planning thing. It were, they were a civilian institution, but they worked for the US Air Force. And their job was to figure out how do we win a nuclear war? Uh, and in this context of doing this research, all these civilian scientists, including Mr. Kahn, uh, started experimenting with all kinds of ways of predicting probability and so on. They set up early computer systems to calculate the likelihood of, the, of, the, of a Soviet missile actually hitting its target and the uh, likelihood of a correct number of civilian casualties and so on. And they tried to run these war games um, to try to simulate what a nuclear war might look like. Uh, and at some point they realized that they were missing a huge thing with these computers and war games, and that was the human factor. The decision making that happens inside uh, the White House, uh, or in the Soviet Politburo, or amongst the generals, highly dependent on individuals and on social contexts. So that's when the people at the Rand Institute started, uh, the Rand Corporation started experimenting with role playing. Now, role playing was a thing because Marino in the 1920s had moved to the US and he had started talking widely about psychodrama, social drama, sociology, psycholo psychology, and so this idea of role playing was very much uh, available at the time. Uh, and at the Rand Corporation, they started using role playing in what they called strategic simulation role playing war games. And here we see an early prototype of this. Now this is the um, military game part of it, where they're moving stuff around. But in addition to moving stuff around and saying, okay, we send a missile over there, and we send a, a battalion over there, and so on, they would also invite people from the State Department um, to, uh, to uh, come on and pretend to be the US government and the Soviet government, and thereby simulating uh, the whole, uh, the whole uh, nuclear war political aspect including messages passed between the different camps and uh, reaction times and all of that kind of stuff. And I did, I think, two or three major uh, simulations involving role-playing. And I think the consensus at the Rand Corporation was that this didn't work very well because it was really, really fuzzy. Uh, because uh, they could not say with anything close to scientific certainty that this behavior which they saw in the um, imaginary war room would be anything close to the real behavior they would observe. However, the people from the State Department and the academics who were brought in, uh, experts on international relations, that kind of stuff, uh, who were brought in to role play top politicians, they loved it. They thought uh, this was really, really great, uh, and perhaps this could be used as a method of research and teaching in their institutions. Uh, and so role playing spread from these, um, from these uh, experiments. Uh, into the U.S. State Department and into U.S. institutions of higher education. I think Stanford was one of the early institutions where they started do, doing role-playing as a teaching method. Uh, and initially they worked with PhD students and gradually uh, the kind of the idea of role-playing simulation spread down the chain. Now these war games would have a big influence in another area which we'll soon come back to. Um, but this is, as far as I know, it's the first meeting of role-playing and gaming happens in this context of this, um, these Cold War simulations. Uh, the spread of educational role-playing from those early experiments and through the institutions of higher learning uh, has, in a way, continued until today. Model United Nations, where kids pretend to be, uh, to pretend to be UN diplomats and simulate international relations in that way, it, they are still being practiced and comes from this period. Uh, and educational role playing, I think, spread quite wide and war, far and wide uh, in those early years. Uh, and I'm not aware of anyone who has a good, complete overview of exactly what research was done in educational role playing 60s, 70s. And that for some reason, from the 80s and onwards, it kind of cools down. There is less enthusiasm. Now, somebody else who was watching, except for the State Department and the international relations people, somebody else who was watching closely what was going on with the wargaming in the Rand Corporation were these guys. St 
strategy game fans. They were not professional military people. Uh, they were amateurs um, or did not want to be professional military people who enjoyed playing war games for the sake of playing war games. Uh, and the guy in the middle there, we uh, can see he is, um, he is Gary Gygax, who later went on to write uh, a best-selling book called, Dun or a set of books called Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and we know that they observed what they were doing in the Rand Corporation for only one reason, and that's the only one source, and it is that the Rand Corporation pioneered the use of hexagonal, like six-sided <laughs> tiles in their boards. Uh, and this later popped up in this community, while sources from that community tend to say that, ah, the Rand Corporation were learning everything from us. <laughs> at the time, also, we are at the breakthrough of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Um, it was published in 1954, 1955, but grew hugely popular in the 1960s. And the Lord of the Rings uh, spawned a number of uh, hobbyist groups that really tried to get into the world of the Lord of the Rings. And this is from a Swedish contemporary one, but their the roots go back to the 60s, called Midgårds Filkning. Here they're having a, a large Tolkien-esque ceremony and they're dressed in costumes and stuff, and I've been to one of those and it's awesome. But, uh, but uh, um, it's, it's awesome, but uh, as a LARP, I have a hard time uh, not getting completely into character at them, because they don't. They dress in costumes, they take fictive names, uh, but they don't spend a lot of energy uh, pretending to be that person. I discussed with Gandalf the Grey, the uh, current mobile phone market. <laughs> uh, so this was also a thing in the 1960s, this uh, wish to come closer to the fiction, and especially uh, to the Lord of the Rings. And so in 1973 we have this uh, innocent little book popping up, Dungeons and Dragons. Rules for fantastic medieval war games campaigns playable with paper and pencil and miniature figures. Now this was what uh, we now call the first tabletop role-playing game. A, table, a classical tabletop role-playing game uh, consists of a group of people, maybe four to eight people, something like that, uh, sitting around the table. That's why we call it tabletop. They have pieces of paper. Uh, and they have rule books and stuff like that. So at first it looks a little bit like some kind of, uh, of board game. Uh, but then you have the final person, the games master, or as he's called here, the dungeon master, who tells the other, OK, you come to the opening of a cave. What do you do? And then the other people sitting around the table say, well, uh, we go in. Or maybe, because they are playing characters, they have a discussion. Me, the mighty barbarian, wants to run in first. Me, the cautious wizard, uh, I, the cautious wizard, uh, con counsel caution. Please wait. Uh, maybe there are dangerous things in there. We should check it out a bit first and so on. And after discussion, they tell the dungeon master, OK, we go in. And then the dungeon master says, OK, you are met by a monster. It's big and it has like nasty fangs and, and stuff like that. What do you do? And then they say, oh, we attack. And then the dice come out and it looks a bit like a board game for a while. Uh, but then you go back to the characterization and role-playing. Uh, this is kind of the basic formula of the, the early role-playing games. It's called Dungeons and Dragons for a reason. They would always be exploring these dungeons. Uh, but after, uh, even in the early years, people started saying, what happens if we go outside a dungeon and explore the wider world? What happens if my character falls in love? Uh, I'm not too happy about the power dynamics in our adventuring team. Um, maybe we should do something about that. You know, and those are precursors to what we're doing today. Now, Dungeons and Dragons became hugely, enormously popular. I don't remember how many millions of copies it sold, uh, the various editions, but at some point in the early 80s, 80% 80 of kids in the US had played Dungeons and Dragons which meant that if you met someone who hadn't played Dungeons & Dragons, that would be a bit weird. Uh, illustrating the popularity, this is the movie, Spielberg's movie E.T., uh, which came out in 1982, uh, uh, and was a huge blockbuster for the time, and depicted some everyday American kids meeting an alien from outer space. Uh, it showed them doing like all, all American you know, kid activities, like playing football and running around bicycles and stuff, and playing Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, which is the, where this screenshot comes from. The same year, we had the launch of another movie, Mazes and Monsters, featuring Tom Hanks, a young Tom Hanks, uh, who, is, uh, who is involved in a group of people who play a game called Mazes and Monsters, no relation whatsoever to Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at some point, I have this dangerous idea 
that you know sitting around the table is kind of boring what if we went into the uh into the old caves under our university uh and uh, pretended uh, to do this for real and this idea drives tom hanks crazy that's basically what the movie is about they go out they do this tom hanks loses his mind and he believes he is his uh, elven character so this was also a mo uh, kind of a high point of moral panic because as Dungeons and Dragons became hugely popular, the rest of society did not really understand what the kids were doing. But it looked kind of scary with all the dragons and demons and, and stuff like that, and they were, were very much consumed by it. Uh, rumors started spreading of uh, a death related to people uh, who wanted to take this game more live. Uh, rumors started spreading of the game causing suicides and so on. All of these rumors have been thoroughly debunked in later years. I mean, there was no truth to them. But there was this huge moral panic. Uh, where media, churches and so on uh, started talking about all the dangers of role-playing based on very little. So a number of children were forbidden from role-playing and still did so, uh, sneaking into their uh, friends' basements and so on to play role-playing games. Uh, the uh, publishers of Dungeons & Dragons, they didn't uh, worry too much because as the uh, uh, moral panic increased, they saw their sales numbers increasing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they had a bit of a hands-off policy. Um, but yeah. In 1978, there may be earlier instances, but in 1978 we know for sure uh, that somebody did this thing that Mazes and Monsters scared you about doing, so this was actually four years earlier, uh, and took Dungeons and Dragons and turned it into a live game. Now, live was then compared to the tabletop, to sitting around a table with dice and rules and so on to determine how the outside world worked. Uh, so they dressed up in some kinds of costumes and walked around in this castle and a uh, games master would go in and pretend to be monsters and maybe drag along other people to pretend to be monsters. Uh, but then they would frequently pause the game to roll dice and figure out what happened. And Treasure Trap is uh, still around. I'm not qu quite sure what it looks like today. I think they've lost this castle which they rented for many years. Uh, but that's the first like, documented LARP group. Now, from Treasure Trap and onwards, we've had a lot of movements popping up of uh, people in different countries, different situations, different age groups who decide to begin role-playing uh, and to do, decide to, to do it live. Uh, and I think live role-playing has been invented independently 20, 30 times. And the reason it's called live role-playing is that there's always been someone not necessarily everybody, but someone in the group has played Dungeons & Dragons or, or one of the similar games and said, let's do this live. Uh, and that's where the name live action role-playing comes from, to distinguish it from tabletop role-playing. Now, all these LARP movements, because after a great number of people started trying to do the Dungeons & Dragons live, which is actually very difficult, uh, because Dungeons & Dragons had lots of rules to compensate for the fact that it wasn't live. And once you take away those rules, you get a very different experience. Uh, but all of these groups have ended up forming, diff or many of them have ended up forming different kinds of movements. And that's where the map I showed earlier comes from. All these LARP movements around the world uh, that continue to practice live role-playing to this day. They were different from every earlier instance of role-playing for a number of reasons. First of all, these groups were mostly non-commercial. There's not much money to be made from organizing and running live role-playing games. Uh, there is some money to be made from doing it for 10,000 people and so on. There are some exceptions to this rule, but generally it's non-commercial, not for profit. Uh, it's autonomous. These groups govern themselves. They're not necessarily even groups. They might be loose networks of friends and acquaintances. Uh, it's subcultural. I mean, you can see I have like long hair and a ponytail and I have a beard and I've had this look since the 1990s. And in the 1990s, a number of people would recognize that as, aha, he's a LARPer or something like that. It's not a famous subculture like the punks and hippies and, uh, and so on, uh, but it still has strong subcultural traits. And it was outside the establishment. Uh, so there were no teachers, no adult leaders and so on uh, going in and telling anyone what to do. Uh, it was all like irresponsible young people, uh, and some of those irresponsible young people are here now, and they're now responsible old people who still love role-playing. Um, and uh, this caused, of course, some further waves of moral panic. So let me just check, am I on time, Martin? I don't know. <coughs> I'm getting close to the end. Okay, we shall speed up. So here's a rough timeline of the history of role-playing in the 20th century, if we accept the beginning with Moreno. 
there is another possible uh, beginning place, which is scout maneuvers, which I'm not going to talk a lot about now, but the Boy Scouts and the pioneers in this, this movement have had a number of role-playing-like activities during their, throughout their history, used to, to train and educate young kids. And they have intersected with the role-playing movements at many points. I think in Norway, when we decided to, in 1989, to run into the forest and do Dungeons and Dragons for real. Uh, the fact that some people knew how to light a fire and survive in the forest because they had been scouts was quite helpful. Um, so we now come to the 1990s, and this is when LARP grows big. I mean, there was LARP in the 1980s and num a number of places, but in the 1990s, LARP suddenly takes over from tabletop role-playing as the main emphasis, the main arena where role-playing is being developed. It grows very immensely in numbers. I think in, at, in Denmark it's been estimated to be 100,000 LARPers, and that's a country of 5 million people. Hmm. How many? 140,000. 140,000. Yeah. And then we come to my favorite era, the one we live in right now, uh, the noughties or uh, the 2000s. So this was my map of uh, where LARP is being played at the, uh, at the moment. Um, and if we are to do a very, very unjustifiedly rough classification of all these LARPs, we have the blue countries uh, that are uh, mostly the English-speaking countries, and Brazil is actually twisting towards green. That's a different story, though. Um, the blue countries have mostly rules-heavy combat-focused genre LARP. The typical uh, rules-heavy combat-focused genre LARP is people pretending to be medieval warriors in a fantasy universe. Inside that box, there is an enormous amount of variety, and people can do a, a whole lot of other things than uh, waving at each other with rubber swords. But still, if we'd want to do a rough generalization, that's what we're looking at. And in the green countries, we may have this, but we also have lots and lots of other stuff. And some of the green countries are the four Nordic countries. Actually, there are five Nordic countries, including Iceland, but I've never met an Icelandic LARPer. So... <laughs> Uh, it's, it's actually one of the countries where it sometimes pops up some LARPing and then uh, it disappears again. But the four other countries have talked together quite a lot about live role playing. So I call it inter-Nordic LARP. We have had long, long discussions about the name Nordic LARP. Um, and just to give you a taste about what we're talking about and what live role playing looks like today, I have brought a number of pictures. Now, here to represent the classical combat-oriented uh, role-playing style, these people are live steel fighters. That means they have weapons of steel. Mostly these are soft rubber, rubber weapons. But they look cool, right? They're Vikings. I mean, Vikings are cool. <laughs> here we have uh, something very similar to those Rand Corporation simulations, a game called Doomsday Eve, played in Norway a few years ago, that set up in three different locations, uh, uh, the White House, the uh, Soviet Politburo and an average Norwegian family eating Christmas dinner in, at some point in the 1980s uh, as these two other groups start uh, more or less begin a nuclear war. In this game, they actually pulled out at the last second. They decided that they did not want to do nuclear war after all, so the Norwegian uh, family could eat their Christmas dinner in peace. Uh, this is an advertising agency, uh, and it's a very dark and cynical advertising agency called Panopticorp. Um, uh, an advertising agency with no morals, and the picture here is taken something like five minutes before deadline. Everybody has been awake the whole night wor working, working on the advertising product that will land them the big client. Uh, Romani, another life from scratch. It's written by Andrea Castellani, an Italian playwright, uh, or right together with uh, Anca Burescu, who was a Romanian immigrant in Italy. Uh, and it's a LARP about Romanian immigrants in Italy today, uh, celebrating Easter Eve. And it's, social, it's uh, kitchen sink realism, social realism. It's, uh, it's very down to earth and they play perfectly ordinary people, living perfectly ordinary lives. And I think the most exciting thing that happens during this evening uh, of this game is that one guy wins a bit of money in, uh, in a sports bet uh, and a couple might be divorcing or on their way to divorce. Fade to Grey, uh, the cultural elite is gathered for a garden party. They, um, they are very passionate about everything they believe in in the, in the beginning of the game. And then as the evening progresses, they change their clothes to grey colours. The bright balloons in the background have already become grey instead. And they lose all passion and begin talking about what a wonderful country Norway is to live in and how lucky we are to be here. <laughs> Love in the Age of Debasement, this is one of my favourites. Um, you play uh, couples. So it's a game that usually featuring like six couples who sit in a cafe, and each couple is on the verge of breakup. 
they're having serious issues. So if you play Love in the Age of the Basement, you'll meet some stranger being told that this, you now pretend that this person is your uh, husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, um, and sit down and live through the most difficult scenes of our relationship. Uh, so th that's the experience we offer. You get to be dumped for real. <laughs> and when I tell about this game, people usually ask me, so why do you guys do this, you know? Uh, is it just for fun? No, it's not just for fun. I mean, why do we, need, why do we read books with sad content uh, or difficult content? Why do we watch theater plays? Why do we, uh, why do we uh, engage in fiction at all and art? You know, with live role playing comes down to the same thing. There are a number of different reasons, but it all can be summed up with for the experience. Either experience in, as in this teaches me something about life or experience as, as in this creates a memory that I, for some reason, appreciate. This is from a musical, uh, a musical fe featuring a game of Russian roulette, uh, Marcel Scheller. Uh, we have musical ops as well, where you sometimes jump up on stage and, and begin singing and dancing. Um, 1942, uh, set in the year 1942. Uh, this is not, I mean, this is not a historical photo. This is LARPers pretending to live in the year 1942. Uh, these people as well. Uh, the photographer was also pretending to be a photographer in the year 1942 with like this old boxy camera and, and a dark room and so on. So it was actually developed during the play. Um, and all of these experimental LARPs that have been happening in the last few years have been bound together uh, by an annual event called Knutepunkt. Uh, that's, I say Knutepunkt because I'm a Norwegian, but it rotates between four different countries. So it is, when it's Sweden, it's Knutepunkt. Denmark, it's Knutepunkt. And in Finland, it is Solmukorta. <laughs> now, if you thought all the Nordic languages were the same, you are now proven wrong. Uh, and every year to the point, a book is published. This is my bookshelf. Uh, it is filling up. I don't know what, all the books, uh, what to do with all the books that these LARP communities keep on publishing, where we've become a very long way in documenting games, uh, writing about what has been done, what has been learned, and so on, uh, figuring out how does it really work, the whole theory aspect of it, and discussing, discussing, discussing. We love discussing. Uh, and so I think a lot of what you will encounter later on this summer school comes from this world of Nordic experimental LARP and theory. But we are not alone. We're not the only people experimenting in the LARP field these days. Um, fundamentally, there are three different ways to look at role-playing, uh, three different aspects. It's something called the threefold model. But put very simply, you can look at role-playing and you can say, this is a game. There are rules at work. People are following rules. There is an intent of challenging players. You are striving towards a challenge. You are beating uh, your opponent, beating the dragon, uh, outmaneuvering other people in a social and diplomatic play. Uh, you can view it as a simulation uh, that uh, let's try to imitate reality in the way that the people at Rand Corporation did uh, to simulate what would happen if these actors were in this room following these rules, doing these things together. Or you could view it as drama, as creativity, artistic interpretation, as a work of multiple meanings. I'm partial to the latter view, but all three are valid. And some LARPs are more of one and more of the other. Now, this Nordic outhouse LARP tradition, and now it's not very Nordic any longer because people are doing this kind of stuff in the US and, and other countries. Uh, it has some characteristic that makes us different from the previous LARP movements. Uh, we don't care that much about fun. I mean, we like fun, you know, fun is good, right? But LARP role playing doesn't have to be fun to be worthwhile. Uh, we aim for intensity of experience, that if you feel really emotionally drained after a game and said, oh, this, this game was so strong, I feel so sad, I feel like crying, we say, that's very good. <laughs> I, I have succeeded as a LARP designer. You know? uh, we experiment a lot with form and content, and uh, we work on many different scales. What you will meet at the summer school are lots of the shorter games, uh, and you will learn a little bit about some of the longer ones. Um, but we can go anywhere from four, four people in a room for one hour uh, to uh, a thousand people spread out over a forest for a week. Um, and we work in all these, these forms. Uh, there are other peoples in this space of exploring modern role-playing games. Um, uh, the indie RPG movement, also the story games movement, or multi-form plays, and, and there are, again, we, we love discussing, so there are many names for things. Um, uh, it's also around. Uh, that's a, an evolution of the old tabletop games. Often you remove the games master and you have different people following uh, roles to perform the role of games master. Uh, you have simple and unique rule systems that often support narrative. 
Uh, the game often provides tight frames for what you can do, but equal uh, opportunities for improvisation. So away with the tyrannical GM, in with the tyrannical rule system, but it's a very simple one. Uh, and it's not very scalable. You can't do it with a thousand people because you rely on people being in the same room seeing each other. Uh, and there's something, something called freeform, and in recent years the borderlines between freeform and LARP have become very, very blurry. But also some of the things you will be play, playing here uh, can be classified as freeform uh, games. And the, there are several traditions in the world called freeform role-playing, and they all tend to reject rules that they want to do without the rule book and the dice and all of that. Uh, and then they do different things on top of that. Uh, often freeform, but not always, often freeform tends to look a bit more as theatrical improvisations in the sense that you have somebody going in and taking directions, replaying scenes, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and some of them might even support audiences, that you could have people watching other people freeforming. But they reject uh, physical aesthetics. Uh, no costumes. Uh, a, a, an empty room is a good place to play, play for freeform. Because then you can jump in time and space very, very easily. So somebody says, OK, we are now two years later in, uh, in a castle. And then everybody agrees, we are now two years later in a castle. And you don't need a castle. And you don't need two years to be able to play that scene. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, we, we can't, with the more like realist LARPs, we can't really do that. Uh, and then we have something you'll encounter very quickly, the uh, black box LARPing. Now this is a game called Bada Minoff Experiment. It was played in two apartments in Oslo. It was about an uh, incident in the 1970s uh, where a terrorist group from Germany was planning a, an attack on an embassy in Sweden. Uh, and the game is about policemen uh, listening in on, on, on uh, these terrorists trying to recruit people from a local hippie collective. Uh, this is from the original run of the game. Uh, that's, that's me to the right, pretending to be a policeman, listening in on the hippies. Um, and uh, yeah, that, this is from the final intervention of the police. And this is the exact same game played uh, a few months later in a large empty room with black walls and floors and so on. Policemen are there trying to stay hidden. Of course, the players, the hippies over there can see them, no problem. Uh, but they're all pretending that this line in the ground uh, divides the apartments away from each other. And this is kind of a bit between the freeform and the LARP traditions, in a sense that we use aesthetics, we use costuming, uh, and so on, but we also neutralize a large amount of the space. Uh, and here's another example of a black box LARP that you will come to know during the summer school when our destinies meet. So, to summarize, uh, here's the timeline. We've visited almost everything on the timeline, except the last and most important piece, the second wave, wave of educational LARPing. Uh, this is a somewhat famous example. There's a school in Denmark where pretty much every subject is taught through role-playing or gaming in some way, and it's a regular school that teaches an ordinary curriculum. And the people who founded this school did not come from like the, the lineage going back to the Rand Corporation and the Stanford University and, and those guys. They came from these LARP communities. So now all of this experimentation and innovation that's been going on in role playing amongst amateurs, amongst uh, kids without adult supervision, uh, as these kids grew older, we have taken what we have learned from those forms uh, and put them to new uses. And one of the most important new uses we're putting those techniques to is education. And that concludes my presentation.